Hey listeners, Stephanie here. Before we start the show, we just wanted to say we have new stickers, including a holographic sticker and a kind of weird bumper sticker. We will have more details on how to get your hands on them at the end of today's episode, or if you just can't wait, you can head on over to our Instagram to grab them before they're gone. All right, on with the show. Welcome to Art Slice, a palatable serving of art history. I'm Stephanie Duenas. And I'm Russell Shoemaker. Stephanie. Yes. What are we talking about today? Today we'll be discussing a couple of works from Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera's brief time in the Motor City, aka Detroit, Michigan. Stephanie, can I set the stage here real quick? Sure. I, I want to tell you about a leader of men, uh, a captain of industry. Oh. You're not going to push me back for just taking it right away? No, I want to see where this goes. Okay. Uh, so it's the roaring 1920s in Detroit, a city in the Midwest, which isn't really the Midwest. It's, it's really, it's kind of like the early East. We'll call it the early East. <laughs> okay. Uh, Detroit, uh, a, a figurehead of industry and thus the symbol of the American identity. His name, Stephanie? Mm-hmm. Henry Ford, the founder of the Ford Motor Company. The Ford Motor Company changed America. Really? It literally changed America. Tell me. Before Ford, most citizens couldn't afford cars at all. What? They had like bicycles, maybe horses, maybe they ride their little dog around. Uh, Uh, But Ford (laughs) was the first business tycoon to franchise stores. So he'd set up these Ford showrooms in cities across America. Like before so, dealerships and stuff? Yeah. He was also the first to allow monthly payments. So that made it cheaper for your average citizen to own a car. It was actually cheaper than uh, buying a fleet of horses. Because you would have needed those back then. Yeah, you, you would have needed a fleet of horses. If you didn't have a Ford, yeah. you would have needed a fleet of horses. Yeah. Okay. And the ripple down effect of this was thousands of jobs everywhere to account for the new driving America. So roads, oil refineries shops to repair these cars, lots of jobs everywhere. But perhaps Ford's most innovative achievement was his improvements to the assembly line. What? Yeah. So he uh, sent one of his little Ford people out a to, yeah, a little Ford <laughs> minion out to tour a slaughterhouse in Chicago. And you're thinking, a slaughterhouse? Isn't that disassembling something? No, I'm thinking Chicago. That's kind of far. <laughs> it's not that far from Detroit, actually. You should learn your uh, geology a little bit. Geology? Yeah, I'll learn my geology, Russell. Okay, geology. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, anyway, so they discovered, hey, these slaughterhouse workers are so much faster because they are doing one repetitive motion throughout the day. Oh, my over God. And, and, and over and over and over and over. And over. And over. So why couldn't they do this for cars? And they just, so they did. They did. They sped up the time <laughs> okay. it took to create a car by eight times. And the uh, Ford factory was able to produce up to 6,000 Fords a day. And they were also able to cut the cost of a car down by a third. So the uh, the factory is called the River Rouge plant, and to tour the River Rouge plant was to see a mile of machinery, conveyor belts, thundering mechanical sounds echoing off of like cathedral ceilings. Wow! It was a sight to behold. So in 1927, uh, Henry Ford was voted the greatest man in American history. Okay, who who was on the committee to encourage loyalty and quality? Ford was good to his workers, right? So he raised the wages to $5 a day, which was double that of your typical factory. Okay. All right. And, you know, it had the, uh, you know, maybe the added bonus of uh, allowing his factory workers to uh, be able to purchase automobiles. Maybe That's his automobiles. Deal. So, you know, Their a little first money. Car yeah. Ever. But that $5 a day pay, it slowly made news across America, right? Oh. So people okay. from the American South, from other parts of America, the Great Migration was part of this. Oh, right. uh, Europe, they all started to migrate to Detroit in hopes of getting a job at the Ford factory. So as you can imagine, there were just all these people like camped outside of the Ford factory just wanting a job. Just really? like this American dream, like Aww. doubling their salary if they had a salary at all at that point. Wow. And the people that were lucky enough to actually get a job at the Ford factory were very proud of their work. These workers had never seen so much money. That's a big deal. Ford was making a ton of money too. He actually, he made so much money that he gave his son, Etzel, a million dollars worth of gold. That's what every horrible. kid wants. 
sounds seems normal. That present, you know, it would it probably would have taken a laborer, you know, at full time work to you know, about maybe take them about seven hundred years to accumulate that amount of money. That's insane. That's insane. <laughs> but you know, Edsel got to dive headfirst into a pile of gold, so it's all good. Uh, and then Ford's like, "Hell <laughs> yeah, I'm good at business. Why can't I also start telling people what to do and what to think? Like, you know, you know, I can run a business. I can run a human mind, of course. So he creates this place called Fordlandia in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil. I'm sorry, is this no, Jeff keep, no, Bezos? No. So he controlled this community of poor Brazilian workers who frequently died of malaria and, you know, he wouldn't allow them to drink or smoke or to have sex, but, you know, that's fine, right? They're Brazilian. Oh we God. don't care. So he's like, this is going super well uh, for my <laughs> next big innovation. I'm, I'm the inventor of the Ford. I'm going to publish a newspaper and make sure it's distributed to all my Ford shops around the country. And it, you know, it's a little bit anti-Semitic or very anti-Semitic. <laughs> a little bit. Okay. He did happen to have a, a huge fan across the pond. In Germany, during, perhaps? Yeah. Oh, okay. A few missteps in a businessman's life. I have nothing to ask. <laughs> So then Mr. Ford, he's like, okay, I'm Mr. America. I pissed off a lot of people with these anti-Semitic newspapers. Uh, maybe killed a few Brazilians here and there. I'm the favorite author of this dude who is, you know, about to be one of the biggest mass murderers in uh, human history. That's fine. A few missteps. Maybe I should hire armed security guards. Uh, maybe keep some machine guns handy at my home. Like Lindsey Just Graham. Case. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and foremans. Lots and lots and lots of foremans. Okay, what's a foreman? The, the guy who watches the workers at the factory, basically, making sure they're a manager, efficient. A making supervisor? Sure, yeah, exactly. Making sure they're, you know, Great. not taking breaks to pee, not taking breaks to drink water, not humming, not whistling, not, not talking to other... Well, they have to breathe stephanie and you know i gotta make more profits more profits i gotta buy more gold piles for my sons uh so i need to make these factory laborers make sure they don't leave their position right if you need to use the restroom i'm gonna make sure a foreman accompanies you and checks the uh toilet bowl and make sure that you are leaving something in that bowl and not just going in there to take a rest uh, and if we happen to speed up the pace of the factory to turn out more cars one day and a worker can't keep up you know that's unfortunate. We'll just replace them with someone younger. So as long as you meet all these requirements, workers, and you're cool with the occasional layoffs, and are, you're not afraid of a, of a little physical vi violence from the assembly line or the Ford informants, you are part of the Ford family. As long as I deem that appropriate, right? Because it's 1929. <laughs> what the fuck could go wrong? <sighs> So today, listeners, we will be discussing The Detroit Industry Murals by Diego Rivera from 1932 to 1933, painted in the fresco style. We highly encourage you to check out the images from today's episode on our Instagram or our website while listening to the episode if you can. Yeah, there are a lot of images because this is a massive, massive mural and we just will not have the time to discuss what they look like in detail in the podcast. Don't get me wrong, it's still very enjoyable. But head on over to our Instagram page at ArtSlicePod or our website at ArtSlicePod.com to see all of the images and a panoramic view of the murals and some videos of the things we talk about today. Okay, enough about Mr. America in Detroit. Let's head to the West Coast to San Francisco. Diego and Frida, a couple of opposites. They would catch your eye out on the street. A massive man, both tall and wide, strolling alongside him, a petite woman with striking features, notably he, her eyebrows. He is a big boy. He's, he's, he's a big boy, yeah. And not to mention that there was like a 28 year difference between the two. They're quite opposite, right? But they are the Mexican painters, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. Yeah, stuff I've heard of them that might surprise you. But you live in San Francisco, so of course yeah, you've oh, heard yeah, of yeah, them. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Did you ever see any of their works while yeah. you were there? I saw okay. the Diego murals <laughs> and I saw uh, uh, murals of Frida Kahlo. Murals of Frida Kahlo. Yeah. Did you like that? Uh, I don't know. You're not part of the Frida mania? I appreciate her as an artist. I don't think she would have approved of her face, her image, to sell lofts <laughs> in the Castro. <laughs> Ooh, I want to want to get back to that later. Okay. All right. Diego was classically trained at the Academia de San Carlos in Mexico City and had spent a decade in Europe studying painting and Italian frescoes. Wow. He had already completed several murals in Mexico by this time, and he had made a name for himself as a great muralist. He was commissioned to paint two murals in San Francisco at this time, his first in the United States. 
One of the reasons murals had been so popular in Mexico was because many Mexicans were illiterate, so it was an effective way to convey a message. Mm. Also, due to its size, it would be visible to more people. It's kind of like a big graphic novel. Yes, exactly. You can see it from far, far away, (laughs) several blocks away. The good and the bad and the ugly. (laughs) Throughout the ages, murals were utilized to stir emotions and inspire its viewers, like religious paintings or sculptures in a Christian church. So think of the Sistine Chapel. Now, through murals, Mexicans wanted to celebrate their pre-Columbian past, a.k.a. before, you know, their colonization, but also look to their indigenous roots. Diego, along with David Alfaro Siqueiros and Jose Clemente Orozco, were the leaders of this muralism movement. So like we mentioned in the Three Witches episode, the Mexican Revolution was from 1910 to 1920, and it had a dramatic effect on Mexican art. The art actually shifted towards a more indigenous and thematic approach because they wanted to instill those pre-Spanish colonization uh, sort of vibes back into Mexico. (laughs) Dang, you took it right out of my mouth. (laughs) Vibes have been like my thing lately. It's just like vibe, man, vibes. Okay, great. The revolution also took the country in a more socialist direction of making the government an ally to many of the artists in Mexico City. So they were commissioning them to make murals for public buildings to reinforce political messages. So they were working in tandem with the artists. So they were not made for commercial purposes, right? And word got out that like these awesome murals were being created in Mexico Mm -hmm. and like the U.S. is like, oh, we want some. So Diego was quickly on his way to becoming like Michelangelo status. Frida, on the other hand, was pretty much only known as Mrs. Rivera yeah, at this time. Yeah, it's cute little wife. Cute little wifey. Just like, you know, that's probably how people think of us when we when they listen to our podcast. What? They're like, it's Russell's show. And then I'm just there's, a wife. There's cute little Stephanie over there. Yeah, okay, that's great. All right. <laughs> Frida was a self-taught painter, and although she had tapped into her creativity and had been painting her friends and family for a few years, she was still blossoming. She made friends with other female artists, and they had these art hangouts that helped her find her artistic feet. She and Diego became part of an artist circle with whom they shared meals, drinks, and the experience of simply enjoying and taking in San Francisco. Mm. Because you, that's a thing. Like, yeah. that could be a pastime, just sitting and taking in San Francisco. San Francisco is amazing. I love San Francisco. Yeah, I mean, not anymore, but it used to be. Frida loved San Francisco. She called it the city of the world due to the rich blend of ethnic cultures and the variety of neighborhoods, architecture, <laughs> perfect weather, and the rolling hills. I think it's pretty cold. But not so- cold enough to, like... Surprisingly cold, though. Okay. Frida loved walking all around San Francisco, especially by the Embarcadero, to feel that ocean breeze and to take in that salty air. This, despite having sustained all those injuries and polio as a kid, she still loved walking around San Francisco. She did. And these also, I think, were times where she felt a little bit better. Yeah. Diego and Frida became kind of a celebrity couple. Yeah. No, like they did. I don't know why I'm saying kind of. They became a celebrity couple. Local painters wanted to learn Diego's fresco (gasps) technique and others were just as fascinated by Frida's eye-catching dresses and rebosos. So this couple of opposites would literally stop traffic. Mm, Probably Ford cars. (laughs) Hitting their brakes. <laughs> <laughs> Locals and wealthy socialites alike wanted to engage with them, but critics began to call them hypocrites for mingling with the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie. Yes. Mm. Diego's commission was also controversial because the Depression had just hit and local San Francisco artists were having trouble finding work mm-hmm. themselves. So just to show how popular Diego was becoming, while he was in San Francisco, he was offered a one-man show at the Museum of Modern Art, brand spanking new, in New York City. New York City. (laughs) New York City. He was only the second artist to ever have their own solo show there. Wow. Who was the first? (laughs) Henri Matisse. Matisse? Yeah. Really? No shit. M-Dog. Yep. Wow. BBPI. Bad Boys of Post-Impressionism Painting? Yep. (laughs) So they head to New York, and Frida actually is also showing a painting in San Francisco at this time called Frida and Diego Rivera. And it's a big deal because it's the first time one of her works is exhibited. Ever. Ever. All right. The demand for Diego is real. (laughs) All of these commission opportunities are rolling in despite the Depression. And then... He lands yet another mural commission, this time in the Motor City. (laughs) 
So the depression in the 1930s that hit America took us completely by surprise. Americans actually had less of a safety net than we do even now. We were the only industrialized country that had no social security for the elderly or the sick, no unemployment relief for the one-fourth of the United States that would soon be unemployed, no health insurance, which of course is totally different now, and the president was of course like, you know, we're going to fix this as a nation, we're going to spread the wealth around in, the, in these hard times just to make everything, make sure nobody dies hungry. Sure. Yeah, no, he didn't say that. He said, <laughs> charities, you take care of the hungry people, and we're going to give bailouts and loans to the companies that, you know, needed it, so the money will um, trickle down. Needless to say, thousands of workers at Detroit's great auto plant had been laid off, and those who remained had their wages severely cut their hours shortened. I mean, no one was buying cars at this point, right? Unless you wanted to live in it. (laughs) Still, Henry Ford managed to make a salary of $32 million, which doesn't sound that great, but by today's standards, that is about half a billion dollars. Okay, Jeff Bezos. Yeah. (laughs) There were evictions. I, I think they estimated like 150 evictions a day. Detroit citizens would dig up holes in the ground to cover themselves with whatever they could to keep as much of the frigid winter air out. Detroit listeners, if you aren't from America, Detroit's fucking cold. It's estimated that during the height of the depression in Detroit, someone died every seven hours from starvation or homelessness. Oh my gosh. And Henry Ford, he had some words of wisdom, of course. Naturally. He would go on to say that the solution was to get together and to buy a farm. These people who had no money, couldn't even buy bread, to buy a farm. Go find land. Start tilling those fields, you starving folks with no money. And if you're lucky, you're going to have a crop I win. Basically, let them eat cake is what he's saying. Let Let them them eat cake. cake. So the people of Detroit, actually, they actually did listen to his wise words, Stephanie. Okay. They did listen to his wise words. They uh, So they grabbed a sickle. They grabbed a sickle and a hammer and joined the American Communist Party. (laughs) So these groups, they worked together for eviction moratoriums. They provided mutual aid and community care. They started to pass out pamphlets on labor unionizing. And they actually, they're like, hey, let's go protest as well. Because this is enough. People are dying all over. Oh, shoot. So in 1932, one of the coldest days of the winter, they all got together, about 5,000 workers and their families. They carried banners that read, we shouldn't starve to death in the richest land on earth. Negro, white, unite. Fight evictions, tax the rich, and feed the poor. What about eat the rich? Sound familiar? At least Henry Ford thought they were going to eat the rich. He's like, no, I'm, I'm too stringy. I'm not supple. So they started marching from Detroit to the River Rouge plant. And when they got there, they were, guess what? Attacked by the police. So at first, the police started spraying the protesters with water. Remember, it is it's a frigid, cold day. So the water was turning into ice as soon as it hit oh them. Oh, my gosh. And the protesters kept coming, right? So then they started to fire tear gas. The protesters got pissed. They started throwing the ice and mud that they, <laughs> they made with that water, right, that they were spraying them with. So the police were like, fuck this. We're going to shoot them with bullets. That's, that's so even retaliation. Yeah. They started open firing on these protesters and their families. Four workers were killed instantly. 60 more were injured, many of them permanently injured. Oh my gosh. Most of them, Stephanie, were shot in the back, which means they were running away. That's fucked up. A fifth worker died later after anguishing from bullet wounds for months. They, of course, didn't stop there. Workers were fired at the Ford plants if they were thought to be lefties. Those who were hospitalized from the police violence were arrested and handcuffed to their hospital beds. The communists, the socialist parties, their offices were raided, their members were arrested. The media, of course, blamed the communists for the assault and killings which took place on the Ford plant. I'm sorry, I'm like speechless. This is the Detroit that Frida and Diego were headed to. Yeah, so they probably didn't know much about the massacre that had just taken place, maybe heard bits and pieces of it, Mm -hmm. but they couldn't have known what kind of shape Detroit was in until they finally got there. They were on a 14-hour train ride from New York City. They watched the New York State Mountains turn into flat plains through their train windows. When they arrived in Detroit, they were greeted by the press, blinded by light flashes like celebrities. Photographers made them pose to recreate as if they had just gotten off the train. While all of the attention was on Diego, a journalist finally got around to asking Frida if she was also a painter. And she replied, quote, 
yes, the greatest in the world, end quote. <laughs> Edsel Ford. Son of Mr. America Ford. So him and the director of the new Detroit Institute of Arts, William Valentiner, commissioned Diego to paint murals in their garden court. The only stipulation being that they would have to be about Detroit. The murals would have to be about okay. Detroit. So they didn't want him going in there and painting his, uh, his Mexican heritage or anything <laughs> like that. Exactly. Um, so this was another controversial commission because, A, it was still the Depression, and Detroit was about to be broke AF. Yeah, broke. I mean, it's already pretty broke. Unemployment was up to 50%, more than double the national average. Jeez. They're about to sell off masterpieces that the Detroit Institute of Arts has. Oh, just for finances? Yeah. So how are they going to get the money for this? Because they're funded through the city. Oh, gotcha. Oh, well, how do they get the money for this? It's a great question. So the director was like, oh, we'll put out some money so we can get someone to come in and paint these murals, right? Mm. They're like, we want Diego. Yeah. But I need someone else to like, you know, I mean, no, 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 uh, I'm, I'm glad these murals exist, but you would think they maybe, you know, make some sandwiches for these starving people. Use some of that money. How about some sandwich money? No, we're going to give you a pretty wall to look at, okay? okay? All right. <laughs> so then this is where Edsel Ford comes in. Mm. And he's like, yeah, I'll pay you out of pocket. No problem. He's Here got that go. pile of gold. He can just like grab some <laughs> yeah. of that gold. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. He's like, I'm diving in it the other day. Just happened to, I just happened to have some in my pocket. <laughs> right. Here's some change. Here's some yeah. chum change. <laughs> So that's another reason, too, this was controversial, is people thought that this would just be a giant advertisement for Ford inside of an art museum. Well, they're hiring the wrong guy. Diego was a Mexican artist, technically doing what an American artist could do. And also... Taking her jobs. Taking her jobs, and then pouring salt in the wound. He was a communist. Clutch your pearls. I'm playing communist music right now. You don't know it, but I am. Okay, in your head? No, in the podcast. Oh, Okay. Despite all these reasons, they wanted a piece of the Diego pie, mm. right? So they were also in competition. It's big boy, big with... pie. <laughs> Lots to go around. So <laughs> they were in competition with the New York Rockefellers to try and get Diego first, right? Mm. Ford won. Diego's murals in Mexico tied modern Mexican culture post-colonization with its indigenous roots mm. to inspire its people to be proud of their identity and to work towards a more just and peaceful country. So it was that kind of inspirational magic that Diego had that Etzel and Valentiner wanted for the people of Detroit, something that Detroitians could be proud of. So Frida's views of the U.S. are souring. She was not in San Francisco anymore, not in the city of the world that she loved. The artist friends that she had made were now thousands of miles away. Yeah, she's gone from that salty San Francisco ocean air to the stagnant smog of the industry in Detroit, Rock City. (laughs) As they toured Detroit, Diego was enamored with the industry of the city, but Frida couldn't look away from the effects of the depression that had wreaked havoc, the conditions that had led to the Ford hunger strike. She sees people sleeping in ditches, houses falling apart, and soup lines lining blocks and blocks. They also see the growing anti-Semitic propaganda that Ford himself was publishing, right? In those uh, periodical newspapers. But yeah, they would see things like Gentiles only on top of doorways, like crazy. I'm and sorry. they, they both have Jewish uh, ancestry, supposedly. One of her first impressions while in the United States was, quote, I don't like gringos at all. I find that Americans completely lack sensibility and good taste. They are very <laughs> boring and all have faces like unbaked rolls, end quote. <laughs> Oh my God, that's going to be in like Frida's diss track album. What did she say about the three witches again? Also, I'm personally offended, by the way, because I'm a gringo, but go on. What did she say about the, <laughs> the, the three witches again? Yeah, she'd rather sit on the floor and sell tortillas than to listen to their BS, basically, <laughs> is what she said. God, she's She savage. had a tongue like fire. Yes, she, yeah, she was. Um, Frida's diss tracks. I like that. Diss I like tracks. That. Yeah. Look for it on SoundCloud. Okay. All right. So going back to her kind of not being able to relate to many people, the Mexican population in Detroit was very small. So she definitely felt like she couldn't relate. So she was lonely. And not to mention that she wasn't crazy about Detroit. Yeah. Quote, the industrial part of Detroit is really the most interesting side. Otherwise, it's like the rest of the United States. Go on. Ugly and stupid. She said ugly and stupid. (laughs) I mean, in Spanish, but (laughs) yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's hard. I mean, okay. I, fair. Fair enough. I will say this. The U.S. is a huge country. It's a huge country. So while there's a lot of beautiful places, there's also some not so. Diego's commissioned. He is in Detroit. Okay, but before he can start painting on those walls, he's got to know what he's painting. Right? So he's given a tour of the River Rouge plant, and he is 
fascinated by all of the technology, all of the machines. Mm-hmm. Just, I can't even miles imagine. and miles of machinery. Miles, and then like, I mean, it's like cavernous, right? Yeah. These, this plant. So you can imagine Diego wandering around the Ford factory, it, it, seeing this like lush forest of conveyor belts floating, <laughs> floating from the ceiling to the floor, from wall to wall, giant forges with like hell-like flames and embers melting glass and steel. Goodness. Yeah, these this noxious, thick black smoke building everywhere. Workers like cooling molten metals like iron and steel and then pouring them into molds for engine parts. And then just the synchronicity of the machinery, the electric Mm. sounds, metallic sounds echoing off of surfaces, creating these infinite rhythms. And then of course all these thousands of workers moving in sync with one another. Along with the machinery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So school children who toured the factory back in the 30s actually said that the workers looked like marionettes or like automaton robots that those are their words. Not oh, mine. okay, right. Okay, I was going to question that. <laughs> but I mean, if I was Diego, I mean, this is probably like nothing he had ever seen before. Or anyone. This was cutting edge. This was the first of its kind, this kind of setup, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Diego is blown away. Okay. He did have a passion for technology. Okay. Mm -hmm. He didn't just randomly accept this commission. Mm -hmm. Like he was truly interested in, in the future, right? Which includes technology and machinery and all that boring stuff to me. So he spends hours at this plant making hundreds of sketches of the machinery, but not just that, also the workers. Right. It's very important. Yeah. Because people play a huge role in his work. They never have generic faces. So while he's sketching all of the machinery and the people, he's also closely observing how the workers are being treated. Right. Because how can you not if you're like staring at them, drawing them, like you're going to notice things. And he's very tall. That's true. So he's probably like, like if he's standing, he's peering over them. He's he's seen those foremans with those clipboards, those informants. That's right. He kind of has like a a bird's eye view. Yeah. (laughs) So originally... Diego was commissioned to paint the north and south walls of this garden court. Right. Okay, so that leaves these two other walls for who knows what. I don't know. So all this is to say that he's he probably looked at it and was like, why can't I paint the rest of this? Yeah. And that's what he did. He convinced Edsel and Valentiner to let him paint all of it. So, Stephanie, tell us about the Diego Rivera courtyard. I think it's just the court. Whatever. <laughs> same, same. So the court is two stories high, mm-hmm. and it's cavernous so it probably echoes as if you were in a chapel maybe or in a cathedral with sky high ceilings for me what comes to mind is the fresco covered sistine chapel where michelangelo's ceiling frescoes made history during the renaissance right because he ended up painting the whole court the murals envelop your periphery so everywhere you look there is a part of the mural most of the surface area of the court is painted. Mm -hmm. What's not is usually like columns columns or some kind of architectural decor, which I believe is white marble, which actually is cool because it makes the murals pop. And then there used to actually be a huge fountain in the middle Mm -hmm. of the court, and it was there until the 80s, I think, but it was definitely there when uh, Diego was was painted. They had to remove it because people kept backing up to uh, look at the mural, and then they trip over and fall in the on the fountain. It's like a it's like a blood fountain now. Too many people are hitting their heads on it. I think you're joking, but I I could see that happening as well. There were also a lot of plants back in the day, but now there are small calla lilies lining oh, the yeah. entire court. Because Diego used to paint calla lilies. Yes. Yeah. There was a resurgence of calla lilies. Okay. What did he paint with again? Was it gum and sticks, you said? No, he used the fresco technique. Oh, oh there they are. Our little pantrymon babies. They're here. They're hungry, Stephanie. It's been a couple weeks. They're very Hungry. They're starving. Yeah, their little tummy need to be satiated. Let's go to the Art Slice Pantry. Let's go. Frescoes are one of the oldest forms of painting, dating back to the early Egyptians. So if you'll remember our plaster art pantry entry, plaster can be used for sculpting, but it can also be used for a lot of other things, like your normal everyday walls. In order for a fresco to last hundreds or thousands upon thousands of years, You must have a freshly plastered wall or ceiling that's smooth enough to paint on like a canvas. Unlike oil on canvas, though, 
A fresco painter will want the plaster surface to be wet. From there, the artist will use a pre-made drawing of the composition and transfer it to the wet fresco surface. The artist will then paint with pigment or tempera quickly onto the surface. You have to be decisive and super fast to create a mural at all, but especially a fresco mural. As the plaster dries, the pigments are permanently set. The paint is now literally part of the wall. It's, it's a sturdy surface. Like with oil paint, you can't just wipe it away and start over if you mess up. You would have to chisel the surface apart, reapply plaster, and repaint. Total pain in the ass. Russell, thank you so much for that riveting minute on fresco painting. Of course, of course. Now let's go back to the court. He convinces them to paint the whole court, right? And they actually have to, like, throw more, more money at him, which is cool, right? Yeah. Edsel footed that. He's like, yeah, sure, I know the DIA doesn't have any more money, but I do. Here's some, here's some more birthday gold. <laughs> Here you go. They end up being 27 panels that he painted over nine months. They were all about depicting the inner workings of the Ford Motor Company. So I know that you're asking yourself, listeners, why? Why would Diego take this commission from Big Bad Ford? Aside from the money, why should Diego care about the working class? He has the money. Yeah. He has fame, talent, the Frida. Who cares about the Frida? <laughs> yeah, the free the Frida. Who cares about the workers, Russell? Who cares? Diego cares, right. He was yeah. very concerned about the American worker, and he hoped that his murals would influence their lives for the better, yeah. right, by shedding light on them and elevating their importance and their position in the industrialization of the United States of America. They're being taken advantage of, right? right. And so he's like, no, 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 these people are important. Everyone needs to know that, and we need to treat them as such. Stephanie, 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 if I could just, could, could I butt in just for a second? Please, butt in. So I'm going to act as the communist interpreter. <laughs> okay. By no means am I an expert. I just think there are a lot of misconceptions of what communism is in the West. So we want to shed some light on what Diego was thinking. It's also important, listeners, because a lot of the research about this work is just lazy. Yeah. At least the research that we had readily available. And that, by extension, the research that you have readily available. People either talk around Diego's communism <laughs> or say that in spite of his beliefs or snidely make remarks like, oh, well, isn't it counterintuitive to work with capital giants? Yeah, fuck no. I mean, that drove me crazy to read about and listen to in those lectures. I mean, this is exactly how Marx envisioned it. Who's Marx? Karl Marx, he envisioned communism and socialism. Okay. Anyway, Marx was envious of capitalism's pursuit of innovation, the way that capitalists would use everything at their disposal, like scientists, engineers, creatives, laborers, resources, fucking continents, just to <laughs> outdo their competitors. To go from man to horses to machinery, or in our case, like computers and AI, right? Right. All just to maximize profits. But Marx also saw this as the the opportunity for humanity to evolve into this utopic uh, Star Trek like world where we're all equal. We're all wearing matching polos. Yeah, we're all we <laughs> I mean, all wearing bandanas or little beanies or something, you know. <laughs> anyway, but the way we would get there was when capitalism's pursuit of technology would push workers out of work globally, and the workers that were left would eventually wise up, get indoctrinated by folks like Diego, and overthrow the system at either the ballot box or or through a revolution. This was precisely Diego's jam. Edsel Ford was like, here are the keys to the city. Please don't indoctrinate too many of my father's workers. <laughs> Wink, winky face. Because I have a theory that Edsel Ford didn't like his father. Well, that's not even a theory. Man was evil, okay. Yeah, yeah. I think he knew. I think he knew his father was uh, a little bit nuts. Lord Fordemort. Lord Fordemort. What, what are you trying to say? Lord Fordemort. Okay. Lord Fordemort. I don't get, what, I don't get it. Yes, you do. You've never okay, heard no. of Lord Ford. I can't even fucking say it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Get me out of here. Okay, so here's a quote from Diego. Quote, An artist is, above all, a human being, profoundly human to the core. If the artist can't feel everything that humanity feels, if the artist isn't capable of loving until he forgets himself and sacrifices himself if necessary, if he won't put down his magic brush and head the fight against the oppressor, then he isn't a great artist. End quote. 
Love it. And that's true. I mean, Diego showed that in his his work the rest of his career. Later on, he was trying to get the U.S. to get involved in World War II to stop the Nazis in some of his murals. I mean, he, he saw this as political opportunity to change people. And like we were mentioning about Mexican muralism, a lot of it was for people who, like you said, Stephanie, couldn't read. Right. So this was a way of getting people politically engaged when they were overworked, they were tired, they didn't have the time or energy to really get politically engaged. He's like, no, I'm going to show you pictures that will get you politically engaged. That's the magic of muralism. All right, listeners. So unfortunately, we do not have time to cover all of the murals. I mean, this is a massive mural. Colossal. Yeah. So we are going to talk about a few themes that sum up the work really well. While Diego has great admiration for the innovation at Ford, Diego was also not naive about technology and the ability for it to destroy as much as it built. Throughout the mural, Diego directly shows the duality of technology as a giver and taker of life. Through this mural, Diego is asking, what are we making? Why why do we need to make this? Do we need 18 different kinds of uh, pickup trucks? (laughs) How are we making it? How does it affect our humanity? Does it promote our experience as humans or does it limit and control our lives? Throughout the work, you feel this godlike power of this technology, this, this technology all around you. You can imagine all of the sounds, the clanging, the banging of metal, and the roaring of that blasting furnace. Yes, listeners. So in this image, we are looking at, I guess this is the foundry. Is that what we call I it? I think so. Okay. <laughs> so here, I think Diego does a fantastic job of painting this furnace and its effect on the ambient color. The metal machinery probably had like a cool blue tone to it, even though it was silver metal. Mm-hmm. And then the flames from the furnace are yellow and kind of orange, which... Yeah, there's this billowing flame. I mean, uh, just looking at it, like, yeah. I can feel the heat. Like, when you open yeah. an oven and it just comes at you. Yeah. Because <laughs> all the baking I do, you know, I... You do through. so much baking, yes. <laughs> as we have established on this show. Right. Okay, so anyway, the flames from the furnace cast a glow on the machinery, which then makes the machinery look green because mm-hmm. of the blending oh, of the blue and yellows. No, really. I mean, I can feel that that constant echoing machinery sound all the worrying the clanging the banging the it's just like industrial noise music all around you very metal <laughs> it's metal <laughs> yeah so you can feel this too through the deep perspective yeah so you're actually okay so we should also say this you're at the height of the workers mm-hmm. so it's as if you're walking into the scene so you're looking and you just see like miles and miles of workers and machinery yeah I think he does a really good job of depicting this perspective which is unusual for murals. You're exactly right. Murals are usually up front. You get to see everything. Everything's big. Mm-hmm. Right. It's a little <laughs> this more... This is sinking back into space. It's mm-hmm. like it's like projectile missile back into space. It's, it's what took me by surprise when I first saw it. Something else, though, I think that might make you have a light bulb moment. It's when you stand in front of a mirror and then there's a mirror behind you. you that infinite and, reflection. Yes. It just yeah. goes on and on and it's terrifying. It always terrifies me because I'm like, when does it end? Where does it end? <laughs> so Diego was pretty true to the size and design of most of the machinery, with the exception of the stamping press, which is the only machine that's been slightly altered. So Diego was an amateur archaeologist. Frida herself, too, was very interested in in indigenous Mexican culture. So when he first saw the stamping press, he was reminded of the famous and feared Aztec statue of Coatlecue. She was a god that was fed human hearts in order to Mm. maintain the order of the universe. The huge stamping press required constant tending to and was also extremely dangerous. People were known to have lost fingers. Can you imagine Diego just kind of like saying to Ford, "Um, hey, you know who this reminds me of? Uh, That insatiable Aztec goddess. (laughs) Yeah, they would have just looked at him. Like, what are the Aztecs? Coatlecue was both a creator and a destroyer of life. Similarly, the stamping press presides over the sacrifice of the workers through the repetitive and physically demanding factory jobs. Yeah, I can definitely see how Diego would think of a horrifying goddess. The stamping press is huge. 
huge, listeners. It's huge. It's horrifying. Yeah, I mean, just think about, like, the space that it takes up and how noisy it must have been. Yeah. If you look carefully, the bottom right figure, his hair is just whoosh because of the stamping press. Like, it's straight up in the air. Mm. It wasn't a cool hairdo. The stamping press is, like, sucking the air above him. No, it's not a Backstreet Boys in overalls. It does look like one of the uh, one of the members of the Power Men 5000. I'm not sure who they are. <laughs> Or what you're talking about. Yeah, it's not. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Okay. Okay. But that's a funny joke for people who do do know who they are. Okay, great. Okay, so a little bit about Coatlecue. She is the Aztec earth goddess. She is the symbol of the earth as both the creator and the destroyer. So she's the mother of the gods and the mortals. Her name, this is pretty cool. Her name basically means skirt of snakes. Mm. She has a little skirt. Okay. Snakes. Yes. That's something I'd want to wear around my waist. Just saying. So this visual comes to us from this Aztec statue that was buried Mm. when the Spanish first invaded in the 16th century. So they buried it so it wouldn't be destroyed, right? Because it meant a lot to them, you know, as a god of their religion. And then it was rediscovered in the 18th century only to be reburied because it was so frightening. It's pretty horrifying. It's horrifying and also... um, Especially if you dug it up. That's even even more horrifying. Yeah, like, what's this? buried this and why did it need to be buried? Well, I have a feeling it was one of the colonizers because they were like oh first of all <laughs> it's a scary shit second of all they're like oh no oh no we can't have the the locals converting back to their pagan yeah uh, yeah we gotta force them jesus jc well, all of our efforts would have been for nothing if they yeah. see the statue which the statue is eight feet tall by yeah. the way eight feet tall there's a fucking gigantic horrifying snake goddess living eight like eight foot tall like below where these people live. Yes. You got to move. You got to like burn your house down and move. Get the hell out of there. That's horrifying. <sighs> So not only was like was the statue eight feet tall, she was displayed on top of another pedestal. Oh, on so ten feet maybe. And then the way that she's carved is she's like towering over you. Like oh, it, my it's God. meant to look like it's kind of bending forward. I'm just thinking too how much the Aztecs were devoted to her because look, mm-hmm. okay, eight feet tall statue. Do you know where they buried it when the Spanish were coming? They buried it underneath a water table. What is a water table? In the ground. You know, you you dig so far and then you eventually hit water. They buried it underneath the water table. Wow. No, you don't. Okay. I didn't know. I didn't know what that was. Stephanie knowing too much and now I'm listeners. I was homeschooled. (laughs) You should know I was homeschooled in high school. So there's a lot. There's a lot of information I don't know. It is deep. They're just like they got to protect her because you know she was one of the major goddesses. Stephanie, all I know is that our Lord made this earth that we stand upon. And there should not be Aztec goddesses buried in his, in his in his earth b- bounty earth bounty earth. Agree to disagree. The stamping press could be argued that it is simply the vicious machine of capitalism, mm-hmm. right? It chews you up and it spits you out. Yeah, Next, yeah. yeah, it has it does look like this statue, very similar to the statue. I totally see it. So people look down on the Aztecs or any civilization that participated in human sacrifice. But I mean, what about capitalism? I mean, exactly. I mean, look at how quickly we reopened after the coronavirus. It was clear that endangering the lives of millions of Americans was worth it to keep that capitalist machine humming. So we got our own uh, quack quack you quack yeah. Qua- yeah. Qua- Qua- <laughs> Come on, throw me a line. Quacu Koki. Kuatlikue. Kuatlikule. <laughs> sure, sure. Coca Cola. That's what I'm going to call her. Coca Cola. Yeah. All right. That's a little disrespectful, but that's all right. Okay. So Diego didn't just suddenly imply this in Aztec goddesses turned to machines. He showed us literally. Mm-hmm. So there was sickness in the factory from chemicals like formaldehyde yes. turning people green. Literally, he painted them green. So the making of bombs and chemical gases that were used in World War One. So mm. remember, that was a, a war unlike any other up until this point. He saw a future where people were controlled by governments and capitalist owners. People were pushed into these positions to create destruction, to create an environment that would make you sick or injure you, like, you know, before workers' comp, all just to put bread on the table. He wanted to enlighten those who would read this mural that this was unnecessary. It was, it was an unnecessary game that needed to be stopped and overturned. Things don't have to be this way. Right. But it was those technological advances that could open the door for equity. This is going to create a condition where work isn't really that needed and work the work we do do 
can become this labor of love and create an excess of resources for for everyone. You see this in the vaccination of children, right? There are these doctors in one of these panels that are depicted like saints, which is a contrast to the scientists creating weaponry for war. Yeah, so you wouldn't expect this in his mural that is mostly about machinery and this factory, but he does have these panels with doctors giving vaccinations to children. And on the other side, these bad doctors who are making weapons of war. So that's part of that duality yeah. that he's so interested in. Every panel has an opposite somewhere. So it's easy to just say, this is the Detroit industry mural. It's more than that. It's more than that. Stephanie, I, I this baby, this baby with no eyebrows and a golden, and golden locks of hair, um, I want to be hoisted up. <laughs> what? When I get my vaccine, I want to be hoisted up in a toga. Oh, <laughs> golden hair, golden locks. Yeah, let me bribe the nurse to get yeah. you a, a toga. Let's get some hair dye. I hate to break it to you, Russell, but that's the Lindbergh baby. Okay. And you do not want to be that baby. Okay. Trust me. And don't Google it. Got some giant naked people here. I see it. <laughs> We have some deity figures here on top of the north and south walls, two on each side. I mean, they're gigantic, Mm -hmm. right? They're they're huge. So there is a red figure, a black figure, yellow, and white. They're all representing the diverse workforce. So Diego is beginning to show that humanity ultimately can control the beast of technology. Yes, and Diego named them the red, black, yellow, and white races, but that was not meant to be an insult at all. Right, and it, coming from where he came from, that communist perspective, once again, he believed in racial and gender equity. Yes, also, Detroit was very diverse at this time. Right. People from all over, abroad, had yes, had, yep. had immigrated and migrated to to Detroit, right, yep. to, find, to hopefully land a job at Ford, because that's where they were paying the best. So people came from all over. Detroit was a very diverse city. So he also wanted to represent that. So each god represents a raw material that forms the basis of the automobile industry. So you have iron ore for the red race. You have coal slash diamonds for the black race. You have sand for the yellow race and limestone for the white race. So all of these together make steel. So in order for his idea of communism to work, it had to be global, right? So not only was this about unity in the Detroit auto factories, but also unity abroad. Everyone has to be on board. So another theme in these works is control. So again, calling back to that duality. Some of those scenes of control include workers headed to work with their heads down, foremen everywhere with their damn clipboards. (laughs) With a really (laughs) nasty look on their faces. When workers would have laid eyes upon these scenes, they would have instantly known what this meant because they lived it every day. Yeah, this was a big signal to the workers like, hey, this is your life. You're going to work. You're miserable. You get there. There's someone looking over you this whole time. And in fact, when I was doing research on this piece, I happened to stumble across a Reddit page where they were... (laughs) Oh, great. (laughs) Yeah, these, these steel workers were talking about their experience like looking at this mural and relating to it automatically. Wow. Like today. Like, I mean, this was a few years ago. All right. Henry Ford is depicted next to a giant mechanical ear. <laughs> but actually, fun fact, it's not just Henry Ford. It's also a combo of Thomas Edison, the okay. great, quote, inventor, unquote, because he stole a lot, oh. a lot of his ideas from Tesla. Did, he, did Diego know that? I feel like Diego knew a lot of things. Okay. I'm not sure. I wouldn't put Weird. it past him. Well, maybe that's also part of his duality where he's like, here's this great inventor, Tom- Thomas Edison, and then here's his destroyer, Ford. You mm-hmm. can put them together. And by the way, Frida was not cool with Henry Ford, like <laughs> low key. Um, she just couldn't look past the fact that he was abusive to his workers. And anti-Semitic. That too. However, Diego admired Ford for that, but she just couldn't do it. She couldn't look past it. And she gave Diego shit for it. Yeah. She's like, Diego, that's too much duality. Too much duality here. <laughs> Tone it down, please. No mas duality. <laughs> Let's talk about management. They're listening with their giant mechanical ear. This is a warning to workers. Management is not your friend. They are always listening. They will throw you under the bus the minute they suspect anything. Do not show that you're smart. Do not ask great (laughs) introspective questions because it will get you in trouble with your manager. Yeah. Get accused of starting a strike. I didn't even have to paint a mural. I didn't even have to paint a mural. Now they're going to go back and listen to this podcast and be like, see, told you. Red commie, commie comes. Pinko commies. Is that Bernie sticker? (laughs) 
So with management and control out of the way, another theme is solidarity, Mm. right? So the other side of that coin. Right. Remember, Diego observed these workers. He spent hours at this plant making tons and tons of sketches of both the machinery and the workers. He was also observing closely how the workers were being mistreated. Besides for the machinery in these murals, the, the thing you'll notice the most are just how many workers there are. I think he's giving the answer by showing the workers just how many of them that there are in this factory. Well, the informants, the foremen, they're lost in a sea of workers. Yeah, Diego paints them in a sea of workers. I I think he's saying there's just so much potential here. There's potential to move past racial and class distinctions that this world has made up and connect with your humanity, just just your humanity. Well, just like the murals back in Mexico were telling the people Mm -hmm. that they could still identify with their pre-colonized spirit. And I think the gods that he he painted above the the factory murals, uh, you know, the ones with the raised fists, I I think that's not a very veiled call for solidarity, (laughs) right? And I I don't think Diego is saying that, you know, any of the the solutions that he's proposing will be easy. Right. It's that duality once again. He is also showing the workers Mm -hmm. what they're up against. But he's also showing them what they're capable of. Right. I mean, they're the ones powering this factory. They're powering that horrifying Aztec robot goddess. (laughs) Whether they like it or not. (laughs) It's like a mirror. They're so Mm. drawn into the work that they're doing, all of their repetitive motions, Mm -hmm. that they don't have time to see the full picture. exactly. That couldn't have said it any better. Diego is showing them the full picture. I mean, he's holding the mirror up to the factory. Look at it! There's this solitary figure in, in one panel who is a worker, He's got his, you know, work gear on (laughs) and he's just standing there kind of tired. But Diego, very subtly, if not, maybe not that subtle. I don't think it's that subtle. (laughs) (laughs) The worker is holding a hammer and he's got a red star in his glove. I love the look on this worker's face. He's kind of looking at his gloves and the hammer, not making eye contact. He's kind of like pensive, like, hey. He's like, like he just realized it. Exactly. Yeah. It's a, a light bulb moment. Yeah. Stephanie. Yes. We're looking at the Art Slice Museum across the Candy and Condom moat on top of the hilltop, the Art Slice hilltop. We traveled a long distance to get here. We rode down these conveyor belts in a factory where robots twisted our bodies like Tetris blocks and placed us neatly in a self-driving automated truck that we hijacked from Google Amazon. <laughs> Inside that truck, we have safely secured the entire Diego Rivera court as it stands today from the Mad Max dystopian future of 2023 Detroit. We did stop to get some, uh, you know, Michigan cherries because those are delicious and no (laughs) dystopian future can keep me away from Michigan cherries. And we have to decide, are we adding it to the Art Slice Museum? Or am I making you return it back to Detroit? Yeah, that's going to be difficult, but I mean, it's a self-driving truck. Okay... Let's start here. What do you like about it? What I like is how Diego is able to tell a story that will resonate with people from all walks of life because it speaks Mm. to everybody. Yeah. And that is sort of the magic of muralism, of Mexican muralism. You just got to know how to tell that story. Tell that story. But and then like blow it up. Right. It's not just like on a tiny canvas. It is like on the side of a building. Right. Or inside of a building. I mean, I don't think there's anything like crazy special about the way he's painting. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's mastered the fresco technique and he's combined that Renaissance technique with something modern, right? Right. With a modern narrative. Gotcha. um, That still speaks to us today, actually, 88 years later. It's pretty nuts. Yeah, stylistically, there's not a lot to his work. and I I don't know if... That's not a diss at all. Yeah, not at all. I mean, it might be due to the fact that you have to work very quickly with frescoes. Could be a lot of reasons, right? What you see is what you get with Diego. He's not going to seduce you with an interesting abstraction or enthrall you with... uh, uh, magical realism like Remedios Faro did. You know, he. it's just what it's there. It's what you get is what you get. His jam is you see <laughs> what you see is what yeah. you get. That being said, like being there in person is a totally different experience than seeing it in a picture. It just is. I mean, there's no other way around it. Like it, it, it encompasses your periphery, like you said. And that's me just from like exploring panoramic websites. Yeah. There's actually, by the way, listeners will put a link up. You can actually experience them through a panorama or just like tons of pictures, really mm-hmm. high quality pictures and you know me I like to get up in there Mm -hmm. and just from that alone I was able to gather that yeah it will completely envelop you yeah so full disclosure I've seen it in person 
I still don't feel like I, I took it all in. I don't know why. I was the only one in there. The sky, it was a cloudy day. So the skylight above it was casting this dim glow over it. It was still immensely beautiful. I just got sucked into that infinity factory on the north wall, I think it is. Yeah. And really didn't have much time to take in much of the other murals in the room just because of how magical it was. So it's not a diss on Diego. He is a really fantastic artist. It's just that his scale is what makes it. Agreed. I think that's a huge aspect of just murals in general you need to experience them in person because Mm -hmm. they're usually about the place you're walking into like you're walking into the history into the narrative of that place right which brings me to the fact that i'm torn about taking the detroit industry murals away from detroit however i don't want to fireball dystopian future (laughs) i know i don't want to fireball to like just (laughs) blow it all up and it's all for nothing so if it means that we will protect it and save it for the future audiences then yes we can take it okay what about this this. what about this let's let's say this okay we have this research lab at the art slice museum that i'm just now (laughs) telling you about okay what we'll do is we'll take we'll we'll send this one back we'll send the original back okay it's a self-driving car it's fine (laughs) um i mean it was hard to get here. I mean, that's a big room. I'm just saying. Okay. There were three self-driving trucks that had to accompany it because it had to have the wide load sign. But let's go to the Art Slice Museum lab. Let's take the Michigan cherries that we have left over. <laughs> let's genetically modify them. And we'll create these like giant uh, cherry uh, uh, protectors. A cherry film bubble. Yeah, the giant them. cherries. A giant Attack of the giant cherries. Can you still eat them though? No, they're Probably giant. Okay. No. Oh, they're giant. No, if you try to eat them, they will kill I was you. imagining a wall with thousands of them, like, protecting yeah. it, not giant. They're like giant cherry golems. <laughs> okay. Okay? Okay. All right. It'll be fine. But we have a good scan of it. Are, we, are you okay if we put that in the Art That's Museum? That's better. Okay. That's better. Yes. All right. Thank you. I just want to be clear that I don't want to take this away from Detroit because it was meant for Detroit, specifically. Yeah. Like, I agree. even in the title. I don't want to have to repatriate it. Yeah. I'm sorry for my weird scenario. I <laughs> no, you're fine. All right. Sorry, Detroitians. Many people objected to Diego's work when it was finally unveiled to the public. I mean, just think about it. Like for months, there was like, oh, what's it going to look like? Oh, <laughs> like what's what's going on? Finally comes out and people took issue with it because he painted workers of different races together. <gasps> like, yeah, God forbid there's people <laughs> of different races working side by side because that's not at all what our world looks like. The gods in the mural were called pornographic. and they the, were naked. The vaccination panel was called blasphemous because Diego depicted it kind of like a holy family nativity oh. scene. Oh, it does kind of look like one. Yeah. Like baby's, he's Baby J. Baby. <laughs> BJ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Detroit News had an editorial which called the murals, quote, coarse in conception, foolishly vulgar, a slander to Detroit workmen. Okay. And my favorite, un-American. Uh, okay. The writer obviously wanted the murals to be destroyed. However, Edsel Ford and William Valentiner held firm. Well, and honestly, the same can't be said for at least one of his other murals. <laughs> yeah, very fortunate. Edsel never publicly responded to the drama. As the president of the Detroit's Art Commission, he wanted to save the DIA and remember that it was in mm. such a financial bind yeah. that they were considering selling off masterpieces to cover their debts. He knew any controversy would generate Generate crowds and crowds of visitors. <laughs> On the opening weekend, thousands of people came to see the blasphemous murals. So it worked. And what did the workers think, you're asking? What did, I am asking. What did the, what did the workers, workers think? think? Since it was so un-American and a uh, slander to the Detroit workers. Well, from what I've read, a lot of them volunteered to protect the mural. So they were definitely Protect it from it. people like destroying it? Yeah. Oh man, wow. I mean, they knew shit could go down. They're like, no, no, no. All of us together, we're going we're gonna to protect this mural. Wow. Yeah. And I believe Diego was euphoric a big boy smile on his sweet little big boy face <laughs> what? i think it's really fortunate that these murals have survived up until this point it's been like 90 something years yeah so it survived its initial unveiling to the public well, the cold war wasn't that far away either well it survived the mccarthyism right yeah. which was the basically the witch hunt for communists in the 50s i think it was mm-hmm. well so the dia had to put up a sign 
adjacent to the mural yeah. saying, hey, we knew he was a communist, but look what he did. Okay, this is awesome. Like, let it go. Yeah. Basically. So it's still, it's still here. Can't cancel the Diego. Too big. Too strong. Big boy. Can't cancel him. Uncancelable. Subscription. Continued. <laughs> Not canceled. Renewed. Frida herself was not adjusting well to her life in Detroit. The trauma, personal discovery, and heartbreak she experienced, all while Diego was making headlines for his monumental works, would culminate in a radical breakthrough. She captured these experiences on small tin paintings made in the Motor City. When Frida and Diego boarded the train to leave Detroit the night before the murals unveiling, she would take four out of the five of those paintings with her. She left one self-portrait on the borderline between Mexico and the United States with William Valentiner. Valentiner might have thought it cute at the time. This small gift from a self-taught painter from the wife of Diego Rivera, soon to be one of the most famous muralists of all time. Frida's painting must have seemed crude in comparison to those of Diego's, but hers held such a raw emotion and pain never before seen in painting. Cool. Is that what we're talking about now? Not right now, but next time. Mm-hmm. No, this is another two-part one. Yeah. Okay. I thought, you know, I honestly, I thought we were a little short on time. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say. Listeners, we have another art assignment. The it's been we- a while. It's been a while. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> The weather is getting nicer, so grab your mask and go outside. Or alternatively, you can get on Google Street View if if it's hard to reach. That's true. Go outside, take a photo of a mural you love or one that you'd like to share with us and other listeners. Or you can take a photo of a site where you'd like to see a mural and actually draw over it on your iPad or something or just, you know, draw a design on a piece of paper. It's an art assignment for art appreciators and artists alike. Also, if you're new to Art Slice, you can send in any of the previous art assignments, like the tarot card assignment, the music abstraction, the flag assignment. So, And we'll post them to our website and our Instagram page. You can send them all to artslicepod at gmail.com. Listeners, as always, we would also love to know what you thought of this work. Or any of the work we've discussed in previous episodes. What you did or didn't like about it, and if it would go in your museum. You can let us know by email, DM, or you can also send us a very short audio recording. I'm actually starting to collect those. I would like to feature them in an episode one day. And we have a very special announcement. We have more stickers. Oh my god. Okay, so we have holographic logo stickers, which I have locked (laughs) away in a bank vault from stephanie otherwise it will not last but we have we have a an art slice bumper sticker something i never thought we would have and here we (laughs) are it's based on a very (laughs) creepy billboard we once saw on a small highway anyway we'll upload it to our instagram account soon so uh, keep an eye out for that and we will also list uh how you can get a hold of them so keep an eye out Thank you to musician Kekap Tuyul, who is an experimental artist who's made an absolute ton of great, moody, atmospheric, noise, ambient, improvised tracks. Yeah, I've enjoyed his work <laughs> a lot. I have to I have to be in the right mood for it because it's a little bit darker, but it's, it's really wonderful work. Check it out. We'll link their work in our show notes. We're very grateful to each and every one of you listeners. We got a bunch of new messages this week and we love hearing that you are connecting with the show. Yeah, it's just Steph and I making these episodes and they, they actually take a lot of time to <laughs> write, record and produce. Um, so it really, it, honestly, it means the world to us uh, when, when we see that you're enjoying them. If you want to Help us out. Subscribe to us on all of the things. Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube. Share, listen, and write a review on your pod player of choice. It helps us please all of the algorithm gods. So that about does it for us today. And no. No. Your kid could not have painted that. Bye. Bye. Bye.